It's always awkward when I have to give these certain disclaimers, because on one hand, I have to tell you guys that building combat robots is dangerous, and you attempt it at your own risk. Now, ideally, I should tell you guys that you shouldn't basically do what you see people on TV or YouTube do, but the only reason I'm here making these videos and building combat robots is because I did what I saw someone else do on TV. You know, just anyway. So welcome everyone, I'm Jason, the creator of Team Rocket Robotics, and this is part two in my series of building an antweight combat robot. We're going to focus a lot on the detailed design process of the thing. Now if you didn't watch the first episode in this series, I'll give you a quick recap of what we did. First of all, we came up with a sketch of our robot here, just to kind of get an idea of what we're building towards. But more importantly, we built what I called a functional sketch. It's basically a drivable combat robot, minus the combat part, armor part, and all things critical to survival. It's just a way to get an understanding of how the basic electronics of these robots works. Also get a little bit of idea in your head as to how big you want your final robot to be, and this guy's going to play a bit of a role later on in this video. Now if you watch other design robots for combat robotics before, you're probably expecting some really cool montage of 3D modeling, like this. But, we'll get to that a little bit later in this process. In fact, designing a combat robot, at least the first step, looks more like this. Seriously though, this is actually a really important step in the process of designing a combat robot. In fact, you'll spend a fair bit of time just working with a spreadsheet to figure out if what you're designing is actually feasible for your given weight class. So what you're looking at here is just a list of all the components I have in my robot, or at least all the components I expect to have in my robot. If you're new to this hobby, go ahead and pause the video right here. You can kind of write down all the entries in this spreadsheet for your own use. Now, depending on your design, not all the details in the spreadsheet will apply to your robot, but this is a pretty good starting point. Just kind of take out the things you don't need and add in the things you expect that will be different. Then assigned to each of these components, I have the expected weight of the component, and I have a color coding system going on here, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But I want to focus on the very bottom first, where I have the total of all the components' weights. In the United States, an ant weight robot will clock in at a little bit over 450 grams, but you'll notice here I'm not actually using that total. What I've got is a much lower value that's about 90% of the actual ant weight's final total. The reason I have this lower total here is, well, you're going to miss a few things, especially if you're new to combat robots. You may get the math wrong in a few aspects here and there. You may forget small things like a few extra bolts or nuts or some wiring, stuff like that. And because of that, when I'm doing this initial weight calculation for my robot, I try to shoot for about a 90% mass total. Let's go over the colors that I'm using in this spreadsheet. Green cells represent components that I have in my hand. I can put them on a scale and get a nice accurate weight. Blue are for components that are custom designed, and while I don't have the final component yet, for one reason or another I've got a pretty good reliable estimate as to what that final component is going to weigh. The yellow cells are for components that I don't have yet, but I've got the information about their weight from some external source, say a manufacturer data sheet or maybe an e-commerce website. They're marked in yellow for caution purposes because sometimes these numbers are not entirely accurate and I need to be aware of that when I'm designing my robot. Red numbers are the least reliable of all my weight estimates. Oftentimes these are just kind of ballpark guesses of what I need or some weird thing like that and therefore their final value could change drastically by the time the robot is built and I need to be aware of that when it comes to designing my robot. At some point you have to start designing your custom components. Ideally for your first robot you want to use as much as you can off the shelf, but at some point there's going to be some custom work, like a chassis at the very least, a weapon system that's also probably going to be somewhat custom, and in my case my entire drive system was custom too because I'm crazy like that. <laughs> I really want to see if I can do it to be honest with you, and I think I actually legitimately can, but more on that in a future video. So how you start with this process is you want to work with the simplest things you can design first. Because you know it's like well if something's not going to work, if a small component is not going to work you want to work with that initially before you start spending a whole bunch of time designing a bigger component. So I didn't actually dive right into the chassis first, I went working on a custom wheel solution initially. 
And what you can see here is I actually got my functional sketch back out. I removed the pre-purchased wheels or the pre-manufactured wheels. And I tried out a first prototype of some wheels on this thing and it worked pretty good. But from there, once I designed that portion of the robot and I also designed the blade of the weapon and a few other small things like that that seemed like they would work pretty good, I then had to design the chassis, which of course is one of the big portions of the robot. And going into chassis construction, you have to think a little bit about what material are you going to use to build said chassis. Most antweight chassis are primarily made from some type of plastic. Thin sheets of metal can be used, but metal of any kind, including aluminum, will get really heavy really fast. Occasionally, very small amounts of steel and or titanium may be used to armor critical portions of a robot. Thin pieces of polycarbonate and UHMW are the plastics that are commonly used as armor and structure for small combat robots. Polycarbonate is what you normally find as the walls of the boxes we fight in, and it's great at taking hits, but when it fails, it can suffer a bit of a catastrophic failure. UHMW, or ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, say that one for you, can't take the punishment that polycarbonate can, but it fails in a much more graceful manner. Small parts of the material tend to melt away when they take hits, instead of having the entire piece fracture. So 3D printers are great for small combat robots. While PLA is the most common material, it tends to fail in horrific ways when it takes hits. As a result, the various flavors of nylon filament are much more commonly used when 3D printing robot chassis and armor. Now there are other types of materials you can use for creating combat robots. The ones that I chose here are the ones that are relatively easy, well, not so much titanium, but the other ones are all relatively easy to work with with commonly available tools. Other materials tend to require either specialty knowledge, specialty tools, or in some cases there can be a bit of a safety hazard to work with if you don't know what you're doing. Let's talk about weapon materials. Unless you're building a plastic ant, which is a totally separate thing altogether than what we're talking about in this series, metal will probably be used for your weapon system. Steel is commonly used for a lot of weapon blades, even for ant weights, but plenty of robots do use aluminum or titanium if steel is too heavy. For steel weapons, water jet cut AR-500 is a great option, but it is expensive. If you want to create your own weapon blade, Certain alloys of steel, called tool steel, can be hardened after doing a custom cut in order to make the weapon be able to sustain combat. What about the steel you can get from home centers? Well, that type of steel is generally not an alloy that can be heat treated. Can you still use it for your weapon blades? Sure. Will your opponents trash it? Quite possibly. <laughs> That being said, all the alloys of steel are roughly the same weight within, you know, a few tenths of a gram per centimeter cube. So some of this cheap steel you can buy from the home centers can be kind of a good thing to start with just to get a feel of what you're dealing with in terms of working with steel and designing a weapon blade and things like that. And then when you're ready, you can go ahead and repeat those same processes with a more appropriate steel for a weapon. And then last but not least, there are commercial options for an ant weight weapon blade if you just want to go down that path. Now let's talk a little bit about 3D modeling programs themselves because frankly what I do is the wrong way to do things but I have a good reason for why I do it that way. In general, the vast majority of people, and by that I mean possibly everybody but me, who uses 3D modeling for combat robots uses a proper CAD program. Um, being an engineering thing, uh, combat robots are really probably better suited when it comes to a CAD modeling program. I choose to use Blender, which is a 3D modeling program, more of an artistic program. So why do I use Blender over a proper CAD program since, well, CAD programs are kind of the right way to do things for combat robots? It's simply because of my background. Unlike pretty much everybody else's hobby, which has like a mechanical engineering background, <laughs> my 3D modeling experience comes from visual effects as well as tabletop game development, miniature sculpting, things like that. Oh, I didn't bring them in Caladasia ships, but I'll put them on the screen right now. <laughs> so as a result, with my experience with Blender, I can do things in Blender a whole heck of a lot faster than I can in CAD. The main disadvantage of using Blender versus a CAD program is, well, two different things. One. In Blender, you're not going to get any kind of simulation mechanical components. Oftentimes, CAD programs allow you to kind of simulate how your 
um, motors kind of operate, drive systems operate, rotational points, things like that. You can't really do that in Blender, so that could be an issue if you need it for some reason in your robot, but frankly these are relatively simple. But more importantly, Blender and CAD programs workflows are basically opposite of each other, which means changing things in a CAD program is going to probably be a lot easier. There are ways you can do it in, in Blender, but it's kind of a little bit tricky. But essentially imagine if I need to change the diameter of all the bolt holes on this robot. In Blender that may require a whole bunch of manually adjusting the diameter of each hole individually and things like that. Whereas with a CAD program, I might be able to go back, punch a number and say increase the diameter of all the holes by one millimeter. It does all the math down the line and your chassis is now up to date. So that's one of the big advantages of CAD. Now it's time for the montage I promised. The actual design process of a combat robot is super detailed. So I'm going to give you an overview of how I approach this. I started with a 3D model of everything I wanted and it was about the size of the functional sketch. Very quickly though I discovered this design was going to be too heavy. What followed was several days of effectively banging my head against the wall trying to find a way to get the size of the robot reduced to a point where the chassis would meet the target weight. In the end the chassis is about 4 inches long and only 5.5 inches wide. Originally, it was going to have a 3D printed armor layer in addition to the UHMW band, but that 3D printed layer got axed as part of the weight reduction. Even then, the chassis was still not going to meet its ideal weight. Other compromises were required, including reducing battery capacity, which meant a smaller, lighter battery, and selecting a smaller weapon motor. With something that looked close enough to a combat robot, and with the total weight of the robot working out to an appropriate amount, it was time to move on to the next phase of the build process, rapid prototyping. So the last thing to not worry about at this point is whether your robot's actually going to work or not. It seems a bit odd, but I'll be honest with you, unless you've got a lot of experience designing these things, by the time you're done with the design process, you may have something that looks like it's a working robot, but until you start actually building stuff, you really can't answer that question, and there's a very good chance that what you design, especially if it's your first robot, it's not going to actually work. But we're going to talk about that and all the other wonderful problems like that in the next video, which is all about rapid prototyping to go from a design to something that is more or less a functional robot, at least in terms of a lot of details sorted out and small things fixed. And then from there you'll be able to go on to build the final robot with you know a deadly weapon and all that fun stuff. But if you want to see this video in the series or other things dealing with say cosplay, painting Battletech miniatures, or other tabletop game related things, and of course more 3D modeling in Blender if you want to learn that, go ahead and hit subscribe. And until then, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. Thank you guys all for watching, and have a great week.